<laughs> no, it's not. I know. I'm sorry. He's here next week, you guys. You'll get what wow, you want. Wow, that was then. harsh. It's okay. It's okay. You want Sam? Okay. I'll... I'll make sure. There you go. Yeah, you got Sam a fan McCarthy, club. right? Good. That's who we were talking about. <laughs> you wanna you wanna do this? I'm sure you'd be great. Hey, um <laughs> we are glad that you're here. Hey, do you remember writing some questions? Anyone write a question last week? Yes. So you wrote a lot of questions. You did. You wrote 114 questions. Um, yeah. Which is great. It's really cool. Um, no, it actually is really good, and we are going to take the next three weeks to answer as many of them as we can, um, and then for the ones we don't get to, we're going to figure out some other way to answer them, because they were really, I know there's like no such thing as a bad question, but you guys asked really good questions. So, um, what I wanted to do was have not only myself, but someone who is probably a little bit wiser than me in a lot of these topics to answer, help I'm me answer older, these I'm questions. I'm older, I'm not smarter. <laughs> older, smarter, doesn't matter, they're both good. Um, and you came wearing your circuit shirt tonight, which we appreciate, yes. I have to ingratiate myself somehow. Yeah, yeah. Can you give Pastor Christian a warm welcome, everybody? Yes, yes. This is probably, or maybe some of the, their first times kind of hearing from you, so that'll be cool. I think so. I haven't been up here for circuit before. Yeah. Well, we're going to start out with a nice, a softball, just to kind of get you comfortable. Thank you. Um, what started your faith? Simple answer is my mom and dad. Um, I grew up in a family that if the church was open, we were there. Uh, every Sunday, most Wednesdays, so that was kind of life. Um, but faith really began to take root and become alive um, when my church family and actually some faculty in college um, began to love me like Jesus in a dark place in my life mm. um, and actually be Jesus for me when they didn't have to. Yeah. Um, and that's when faith actually began to like come alive and I saw it. Cool. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was like trying to think about this question too and I couldn't kind of like you, I couldn't pinpoint it to a moment. And I wonder if you guys have like a similar experience like that. Like I think about growing up here and, and going here Wednesday after Wednesday and getting to know my small group and going mm -hmm. on a few mission trips and like almost like you wake up one day and you're like, whoa, like <laughs> I have a faith. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't really um, pinpoint a moment. I think that's kind of interesting because I think a lot of us feel like if we have this like God moment, then that's what's going to start our faith. But doesn't seem to be the case for either of us, us, which is kind of interesting. Right. But all right, hey, we are going to talk about science and faith because a lot of you had questions about science and faith. Um, there's two slides, so I'm going to read these all off, and then we're going to kind of tackle them because there's I'm some repeats. And I'm not a scientist. Yeah, but you know some science, which is good. Should I believe in evolution? How does evolution fit into the biblical story slash Jesus? How does the creation of the earth in science compare to that of the Bible? I've heard the world is thousands of years old, but I have not heard one time like 6,000 years. Why is there no one time period? Next slide, just so we can see them all quick. What did the Bible mean when it said seven days to create the universe? Does, <laughs> does that mean seven days today or was it actually a longer span of time? Dinos, aliens, how, people are hyped about the dinos. Uh, <laughs> we'll make sure we answer that. How did the Bible and science coexist because of the ways they disagree on many things? It's a lot of questions. We'll go back to the first slide, but we're going to kind of tackle them all right now. There's a lot there. There is and a lot there. Yes, I know that like Sam talked about some of this last week, but based on the questions you asked, Sam might not have done a great job. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that up with him later. Um, but uh, should you believe, I'll, I don't know. I could just go in order. That would be boring. Sure. Should you believe in evolution? I think so. Um, uh, I'm convinced that evolution fits into the biblical story. I'm also convinced that faith and science are not at odds. Um, they answer two very different questions, um, which gets into the how old is the earth, um, what is creation like, and do we believe in seven days? Um, the Genesis account, uh, we put a lot of stake in the Genesis account. Uh, and there's a lot of good Christians who read the Bible um, and in the way they read it, they read seven literal days of creation, and they read that the earth is 6,000-ish years old. 
Um, and then they go talk to scientists, and scientists say, no, the earth is actually like billions of years old, and what do we do with dinosaurs? Uh, and I think those are all really good questions that are not at odds with one another. Uh, and the first is we have to talk about, and I think Sam talked a little bit about this last week, which is, what do we do with the story of creation? What do we do with Genesis chapter 1? Um, and the first thing I think we have to do with Genesis chapter 1 is realize that Genesis chapter 1 isn't a textbook. Like, how many of you are in a history class right now? History classes are filled with textbooks that tell you, like, when Columbus sailed, and when the United States was founded, when the Declaration of Independence was signed, when the Great Pyramid was built. Like, it gives you these facts and dates. And I don't think that that's what Genesis 1 was meant to do. Genesis 1, in Hebrew, the language it was written, is actually poetry. It's a poem. And it does something, I think, very different than a textbook, something very different than science. Science is great at answering questions like how, but it's not necessarily great at answering questions like why or who. And I think there's, a, there's this big distinction in those. Um, and so we can, we can hold those things together. The Bible, I think, answers questions like who God is, who we are in light of that, and how we understand creation. Understand it, but not the, like, details of it. Um, and so one of the things I think about is, like, science... Is the next slide the dinos and aliens? Oh, yeah, it is. Ask yep. your small group leaders about aliens. No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to do that. Um, but uh, to get into this, science answers the, asks questions like what and how. So what? How do we understand that there's dinosaurs? Like that there's these fossils? Um, one of the, I don't think it came up in senior. Junior asked, um, are there dinosaurs in the Bible? The answer to that question is possibly. There's two places, one in Isaiah, potentially one in Daniel, but then one in Job, where they describe these giant animals with armored plates and legs and arms like uh, iron beams or bronze beams, um, which could describe dinosaurs. So I think it's super fascinating. Um, and I think that dinosaurs fit into the creation narrative. The seven days of creation as it's written in poetry. So like you would sing a song, like you would read the Psalms, the Genesis narrative tells us about a God who loves us, who created the world as good, who created you, who created humans very good, uh, and who wants to be in relationship with us. And so the word day um, that we often use, there's seven days in creation, right? That's what we've always heard. And on the seventh day, God rested. Day there could mean a lot of different things. It could mean a 24-hour period. It could be some day, like some future time. It could be a, like a million years. It could be, an, like we could say, an era. Um, it could be a long span of time. The word gets used in a lot of ways. And so it could be seven million years that it's talking about. But it's about the way that God set the world in motion and who he and how he placed things into it. So science does a really good job at answering the like, stuff we can research and look into. I love science. Um, I read a book recently by um, a scientist, a well-known scientist here in the U.S., who talks about the creation narrative. And he says if you compare it to 24 hours, the uh, kind of the Big Bang uh, creation out of nothing, ex nihilo, starts at uh, 12.01 a.m. Dinosaurs enter the earth. I misquoted this last time. Uh, dinosaurs kind of show up around 11 a.m. And humans, as we know them today, show up on the scene at 11.59 p.m if you were to kind of put creation in a 24-hour span. Hmm. Like, it's this really cool thing. Um, there's so many more up there. I kind of want to, like, answer all of them <laughs> in crazy ways. Yeah. Um, but I think they can coexist. I think science and faith don't have to be in tension because they're answering different things. I describe it like baking a cake. How many of you have received a cake for your birthday? Somebody baked you a cake. Okay, good. You know what, do you know what cake is? 
like half of you like didn't raise your hands. I'm a little worried for you. <laughs> ben loves cake. Amen. Let's go. I like this. So um, if you get a cake for your birthday, science can tell you what it's made out of. Maybe what the temperature it was baked at. Uh, maybe how long it's been around. It can answer a lot of things about the cake. What science can't answer for you is who baked the cake and why they baked the cake. And that's similar to science and faith. Science answers the, the what. Faith talks about, bi the Bible answers the why is it important and who is it that set it all in motion. Yeah. And I think sometimes the reason these questions get asked is because there are Christians who I think do tend to read this book a little bit more scientifically. And I think, mm -hmm. th and there, I, if there's one thing you take away from this series, we're going to sit up here and answer questions. But for most of the things that we say, there are faithful, good Christians. Mm -hmm. I don't even like to use the word good, but just faithful Christians that maybe believe something different. Mm -hmm. I think that's important to know that like we're sort of discussing, making informed sort of um, explanations from mm -hmm. what we've learned and sort of discovered, but it doesn't mean that it's the only answer if, or if you think of something different, certainly about science and faith that, that you can't be a Christian. But I think what happens is we, A, we encounter Christians who maybe believe more of this mm -hmm. science and faith thing. And then I also think that a lot of times in um, actually like non-Christian settings, that gets presented to us like, oh, hey, um, the Bible says seven days, but science says a million years. And what they do is they get set right alongside each other. So we think that they're answering the same question like you mm -hmm. said. And so I think that's why so many of us go, oh, science and faith much contr must contradict because we've had people hold those two things up next to us and go, they're, they're trying to say the same thing. And so what we, what we actually believe is that they're not. That the Bible's main purpose more than anything else is actually to tell us about who God is and who we are because of that. That, you know, that is its purpose. That is why it is written. And then as people who get to be called by God, who get to, uh, in Genesis it says that we are given dominion over the earth. I think that means to steward it well. We get to use our gifts and abilities and tools to discover how this world works. And so that's what we'll say for that. And, it, and especially like if you love science or that sort of thing, science I think is awesome because really what you're doing in science is you're uncovering the amazing ways that God created the world. Yeah. I mean, you're helping us understand God better. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to go to the next set of questions. Understanding the Bible. How do we know that the Bible is true since it has been passed down for thousands of years? Is there proof that the stories in the Bible are true? How do we know that the Bible and Christianity are fully true? There's Everything. a lot of truth in these questions. This one might actually be... Um, the junior high. Oh, this is good. Everything happened so many years mm -hmm. ago. How do we know it's all true? Um, yeah, those are the questions. Okay, How I do wanna, we understand the Bible? I want to say something about the word true in this case. Um, because one of the things like Sam talked about last week is there are stories in the Bible that are kind of, um, they're, they're that. They're stories that Jesus uses for especially like explanation. And he makes them up. And so true like... Um, we have to wrestle with that a little bit to understand what you're reading. Yeah. Um, even like um, the way David describes things in the Psalms, like um, he's painting a picture. He's using poetry and song to like help us out. Um, but I think what my guess is what you're getting at with a question like that is how do we trust, how do we know we can trust the Bible? How do we know we can trust that it's true? Um, there's, there's an interesting comparison I'll make in this. In some of your history classes, you're going to talk about documents or stories that were written around the same time as Scripture. You're going to read, you're going to talk about narratives, stories from ancient Egypt. You're going to talk about things from ancient Greece. You're going to talk about maybe things that were written in Rome, maybe about the same time as the Bible. And when we look at those, there are... Uh, very few manuscripts that still exist. A manuscript, fancy way for the writing, right? Yep. Um, and in some of those, like one of them is about a war that Caesar had. There's like nine copies of it in the world, and we believe that it's true. We believe that it's an accurate representation of uh, what was written down, of what actually happened. 
in, of the Bible, we have thousands and thousands of copies that date almost all the way back to the original writings of the New Testament, so almost back to the year zero, about the year a uh, hundred or so, most go back to, um, and they don't really disagree with one another. They were faithfully copied and passed around, uh, and so we know the Bible that we have is the Bible that was written thousands of years ago, over thousands of years as well. And so we can, um, the people that wrote those and had those original stories and told one another about them and then ended up writing them down, um, like faithfully copied those. And we can trust that they got handed down faithfully over time. Yeah. Um, there's another way I think you can look at that. And um, I'm going to, the big, like, boring word is textual criticism. Um, Gabby's heard so much about this, she's actually going to fall asleep on me right now. It's really boring. I, I had a textual criticism class in college, and my teacher said, this is the most boring class you're ever going to take. And he was teaching it. So anyways, keep It's going. boring. Yeah. Um, but here's the point of it. Um, uh, I'll use the example from here. The dad joke skit. Um, if I pulled four of you up front right now to tell me the story about the dad joke skit, you're going to tell me four different stories. You're going to highlight different things. You're going to maybe get the order mixed up on who came up when. But from those four different stories, we're going to get a picture of what happened up here on the stage. That's what the four gospels do. There's four writers who tell us stories about Jesus. And do they always line up 100%? No. Because there were four different people telling us the same story. And that actually helps us believe that what we read there is true because they were willing to put in accounts that, that we have to figure out. Yeah. Because they believed the stories that were being written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And it, it is true. The Bible is incredibly unique in the way that there's so many copies of it. I was, uh, that it's so well documented going back to the time that it was written, as Absolutely. you say. And, and I do think, like, there is an element of faith mm -hmm. in all this because we can't actually live these events. So, like, there's an element where we just have to believe and trust. But I do think there's, there's good evidence for that. And I think one of the things that's about the Bible sometimes that we forget is we look at this book and we say that it's divine. That it is all God in there. But really what God did is he used human beings to write the Bible, which shouldn't surprise us, right? Because we talk all the time about how God uses people. He does that today too. And so I don't think we should be surprised that, that this book is, yes, it tells about God. We believe that it's divine, but we also believe that it's human, that human beings wrote that and that they were imperfect at times. I think that's important. All right. Absolutely. I think we're going to try to hit the okay, last section. As much as we can, let's go to the next slide. Reading the Bible, what is the best way to read the Bible so it is easier to understand? Which of the books in the Bible are the easiest to understand, the hardest? How does the Bible relate to current things? We'll probably touch on more on this in coming weeks, but give us your best shot here. Okay, um, best way to read the Bible, uh, e so it's easier to understand. Okay, yeah. um, how many of you are aware that the Bible was not written in English? Okay. The uh, Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek, um, which means people have to make decisions on how to make it into English so we can read it. Um, the art of translation. There's lots of translations out there. There are just some that are easier to read. They're easier to understand. There's some harder ones to read and understand. So my first, my first actual thought is if you have a paper Bible that's hard to read or you're having trouble understanding it, like, maybe just go get a different one or download something like the YouVersion app where you can pick different translations. Sometimes just picking up a different translation is an easier way to read it. Um, yep. So that, that's a way to understand. Start with something like the Gospels. Start with John. Um, start with Luke. Luke's a really good place to start. Um, some of the harder ones, Romans is actually a really hard book to read because... Um. Paul, like, yeah. writes it like a court case, and it's hard. Revelation, people still don't know what that means. Right. Let's go. Don't, yeah. So, if, you, if you, like, choose to do one of those, like, read the Bible in a year things, 
skip the book of Numbers. Oh, it's like, so just like, you will fall asleep. Some of you, and we struck a little close to home. Yeah, I think, like, even at our, our Thursday morning Bible study, we've got one person who reads the message version of a Bible, which isn't, it's where they didn't translate word for word, but mm -hmm. it's what they did is they tried to get the essential meaning. It's a lot easier to read, so I think the message is a good, or my friend Josh Wallace, I don't know if he's here, he reads the easy to read version. Let's go. Let's go. Which is... <laughs> Which is solid. Like, Which is exactly like it sounds. And you won't believe how many times we're like going through Ephesians and we're like, shoot, what does this mean? And someone's like, Josh, get the easy to read version. And we, we figure it out. So, we do that in my small group. Like, yeah, yeah. We do it all the time. Yeah, I would also, I think um, somebody said besides the Gospels, I think the Gospels are the easiest to read. Um, I think James is an easy book. Oh, yeah. I think Philippians is. I think Ephesians is. Those are some other good ones to kind of jump into. If you want an Old Testament book, I think that Esther is a pretty easy one Ruth to understand. Ruth and Esther are good. And they're about women, which is cool. Let's go. <laughs> you would. I would. would. I had to. Um, but I think those are some tips. And, and really, I think what I want to take away from this too is I was listening to something today and I thought it was really um, true. And it was talking about how the, the sort of interesting thing about the Bible is that it tells a, a base level message that really anyone can understand. Mm -hmm. It tells us about who God is and in the New Testament specifically it tells us about Jesus. And so I don't think that you have to um, understand everything that you're reading to get a picture of who God is and who Jesus is. So if you read one chapter of Matthew and it doesn't make sense, you might read another and you might say, okay, I don't know, understand what everything is going on, but I, I see what Jesus is doing here. And I believe that any person in this room can understand enough to actually get what's important. Now, there's this other part of the Bible where, where it's incredibly complex. The Bible is not an easy book to read. It's, it's not. It, it, and I think sometimes we think, like, well, shouldn't it be? But really, it, it has this, these layers and these complexities where you, you go to school for a long time and they teach you about the cultural history and you understand the language and the vocabulary. And so that's why we have people like Christian and, and myself who, who go to school to understand this stuff to tell you, but that isn't on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That like there's no expectation that you're going to be able to open to a random page of the Bible and immediately know everything that's going on. We can help teach you those things, but what you're supposed to do is just faithfully go to it to say, hey, I just want to know more who God is. I want to know more who Jesus is. I have a couple of passages that are really comforting to me that remind me what is true. And, like, if you're doing that, you're doing it right. And I just, that was my soapbox. That's a great soapbox. <laughs> yeah. I think that actually gets to the last thing. How does the Bible relate to current things? Yeah. Um, I think as you um, certainly put in perspective, you read the Gospels, and you learn about who Jesus is. You read the Genesis 1 account, and you read about how God loves us. Like, those, like, help anchor who we are. Like, we get part of our identity from that. But then you read things like Corinthians, or you read um, some of the other letters in the New Testament, and honestly, they're dealing with things like we are today. Yeah. Like, how do you live in a, uh, Corinth was a city, um, I think you could honestly sometimes compare it to Las Vegas here. Yeah. Um, and so Paul's writing a letter to Las Vegas to say, like, hey, there's some tough ways that we have to navigate the world. So why don't we read and figure out how to navigate the world? Mm -hmm. um, but on a base level, it just helps us know who we are. So when we walk out into the world and we see things that suck, <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, um, we can say, oh, yeah, yes, the Bible helps me understand that that's going to happen but there's something greater going on. Yeah. There's something greater yeah. out there. I think one of the things, and then we'll, we'll close, one of the things that helped me when I was in school was that um, I had somebody tell me that the, these, the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, they were written um, as guides to discipleship. Mm -hmm. That they were written to tell you about Jesus' life, but in each and every book was included sort of this question of, and do you want to follow? Mm -hmm. 
And so they were written with the expectation, not only would we learn about Jesus, but we'd also want to follow Jesus and, and to model ourselves after Jesus. So yes, this Bible tells us about Jesus and who God is. And then it also extends an invitation to us and says, and, and do you want to follow? Do you want to say yes? Do you want to be formed more into um, the person that God is calling us to? And so like the Bible's not going to include um, phones in high school in their scripture because those didn't exist when it was written. But what it is going to do is it's going to tell us and invite us to see the way that Jesus lived, mm -hmm. to, to understand who we are because of who God says us. And then I think we're given this like cool task ourselves to say, okay, if, if these are the things that Jesus says, what does it mean to, to follow Jesus today in 2021? And I you can do that. Like, it yeah. doesn't take one of us yeah. to sit down and read scripture and tell you that. Like, yeah. you can do that, and you can do that together. And there are principles that are timeless, even though the context is different. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, I hope this was helpful. This is week one. We are going to pray and sing a little bit more. And then um, the hope with this is that uh, we talk about questions here, and then you discuss them in small group. Because the point isn't just that we answer a question, and then it's done, and it's complete. It's for actually you guys to decide what you think about this topic and to dig into it a little bit deeper. So, can I pray for us? Yes, you can. All right, let's Please do. do. Uh, would you stand? God, we give you thanks that you continue to reveal yourself to us. Uh, Lord, that you want to meet us in the words of Scripture and you want to meet us uh, through the voices of one another. And so, God, um, you are not too big for our questions. God, you welcome us with all our wonderings and our wanderings. Uh, and so, God, I pray tonight that as these students open Scripture, as they read your good and beautiful word, as they debate these things in their small groups, God, would you just continue to walk with them on that journey? Um, allow them to ask. Allow them to wonder. Lord, open their eyes to the great things that you have for them in your good word. Um, God, and we give you thanks for the ways uh, that you do not leave us. And so, God, we thank you for tonight. Amen.